let's get right into our topic for today, which is getting your financial house in order. And I am just excited and delighted to have with us a financial guru. And I mean that. She is a financial guru. Uh, Mrs. Lizetta Braxton is the uh, founder and CEO of Financial Fountains, which is a registered investment company. She's a registered investment advisor specializing in personal financial planning and investment management. Uh, we've seen her on NBC, where she's a part of the advisory, Financial Advisory Council. So we've seen her on the NBC Nightly News. We've seen her on Reuters. She recently received the financial, uh, excuse me, the Heart of Financial Planning Award from the Financial Planning Association. She received the Excellence in Diversity Award from Investment News. Uh, she's a graduate of the Babcock Graduate School of Management, where she received her MBA, as well as the University of Virginia, where she received a Bachelor of Science in Finance and International Business. When I tell you she's a financial guru, trust me, trust me, she is. And she's going to help us today uh, in ministry look at some very difficult uh, questions and just questions that we have about getting our financial house in order. Want to thank those of you who sent me uh, your questions and comments uh, over the weekend. So we want to dive right into it. Lizetta Braxton, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Simmons. I am so All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. The first question that I was asked over and over again was from clergy who are pastoring their first church. Basically, they're making between 50 and $60,000 and they're, they've got $200,000 or more in student loans what would you advise for clergy or ministers in that position? Uh, yes, I, I do see a lot of clients and clergy in this position. And so a couple of things I suggest to them. First, there are federal, if they're federal loans and look at the income based repayment programs. So it's aligned with your income. That's an important uh, opportunity that people should not pass up. And, and I said federal loans. Unfortunately, for private loans, there is not such a formalized program. Um, the other consideration um, is with these student loans, and I probably should have started here, is to say you may be probably so taking your loans to your grave if you have probably more than $100,000 in student loan debt. It is my hope as a profession and, and with legislation, um, with this bubble that is just on the horizon at some point, it has to be corrected. But until then, um, be diligent with, with making your payments, looking at ways to make your payments lower, looking for federal programs, certainly for the income-based repayment programs as well, too. Um, and within your denomination, you know, some of them have the loan forgiveness program. So if you're in a denomination that offers that, if you're not even sure, find out, uh, research that. Now, obviously for standalone churches may not be the case, but for some mainstream denominations, they do have loan forgiveness programs as well too. So that's kind of two of the, the, the starting points to see if you can reduce that payment and the psychological idea that, um, unfortunately, the way the loans have been structured, um, it, it, it has, it's quite offensive <laughs> um, to say the least, but it is what it is. And to, to rest assured, just be faithful with your payments uh, with them as well, too. OK, OK. Um, people ask generally. Uh, if I am in ministry, especially for ministers of music, how do I declare that I am uh, a clergy uh, when I'm basically paid in 1099s and 
what's the process for dealing with that? Okay, so a 1099, and I'm gonna respond to this question because I actually have another thought about the student loans uh, that I, okay. I have to go back to. Now, I talked about student loans, but what I also find out with people is that we just need to talk about overall debt. Because with student loans, okay. most of your student loans in terms of interest rates now are gonna be lower than your loan, say, for credit card debt. So student loans, obviously, because you need to have that degree in order to serve in ministry, that's kind of what you see as a necessity. There's no way around that. With the consumer okay. debt, right, there, there, there is, right? So I don't want people focusing and getting hung up on student loan debt because it's just necessity debt that you have to have and just be strategic about paying it, getting reduced and being faithful to making that payment. Uh, what I can't have people do is lump student loan debt with credit card debt, which oftentimes is not necessity debt. And so if exactly. the our debt is going to be there, let it be on the ones that are that's in your control, because oftentimes student loan debt is not because it's a systematic issue. So I just want okay. to okay. I'll bring it back to what the question about the 1099 miscellaneous. Now you, and I want to make sure I heard this question correctly, is that you are focusing on, on people like uh, musicians, correct? And the reason why I'm saying uh, ministers of music, ministers of music, and others who are in ministry, but they may not be on staff at a church, and play or offer services to several churches, and they're paid by 1099. OK. And the reason why I wanted to make sure I was hearing properly how you were classifying or how you were describing, I should say, um, people in this situation, because I have to be abundantly clear. Pastors who are serving a congregation should not be a 1099. So the people that you exactly. are, describing, yes, they can be because they are contracting. They are going to different churches um, and, and serving because they are given the freedom to bring their expertise to the environments and they're not under the instruction of leadership at a particular place. So we have gotten that clear about right. who could get a 1099. So with a 1099, that says that there will be no taxes withheld whatsoever. So I'm going to use the language of gross payment, meaning it is if you get a thousand dollars, that is gross. That is the total amount that you are receiving. The other term I'm going right. to connect now is net, meaning oftentimes you get paid. It is not net of taxes, meaning taxes have not been taken out. And specifically taxes, we're talking about income taxes. Right. So when we're talking about income taxes, let me bring into discussion what some most people are familiar with, W-2s. So you have a W-2 and a 1099 employee. w 2 they have the benefit of the employer paying half of their income tax withholding. And in that case, the total amount is 15.2, and that's going to include your uh, federal holding withholding, that's uh, Social Security um, as well, too. So the Social Security piece, that has to be paid as well, which is not, once again, coming net from a 1099. So what we say for those who are receiving 1099s, one, say you are responsible for the full 15.2% for what we call, in this term, Social Security. It, it's really OSDI. I don't want to get too technical, but what we know it as is Social Security. There's some other elements, disability, that's a part of this quote unquote insurance, but we're I'm just going to call it to keep it simple, Social Security, 15.2%. That does not include your income tax withholding as well, too, which comes into play when thinking about how much total income you've had for the year. So what does this all mean? You should be making quarterly estimated tax payments based on how much you expect to get with your 1099 payments for the year. So you're looking at this from a calendar base, not just an event by event base. So for those who exactly. are new to the 1099 world, I want you to set aside at least 20% of what you're making. So if you make $1,000, I want you to set aside 200 bucks for tax payments. 
And that is just a flat line, not considering what you've made for the year. And if this makes your head spin, that means you need to have a tax professional working with you. Don't play around and try to figure this out on your own. <laughs> it is complicated. If you say, I don't have All right. to pay for it, then use TurboTax and play around with some numbers. But no, for 1099, there are two types of taxes that you are responsible for. Your income tax, and that could be federal and state, as well as your social security tax. And pay your taxes quarterly if you're getting paid. Set aside and pay it quarterly. Quarterly. And that's what the IRS mandates. Because when you do your tax returns, they're going to see what you've submitted. And if you haven't submitted timely on a quarterly basis, you're going to be penalized for that. And that's going to show up on your tax return. Exactly. Exactly. That's why that quarterly is so important for people who are not as staff, church or an other religious organization. Okay. okay. Yeah. And this uh, would so also just be clergy who are doing revival. So I see a comment out there. If you go to a revival and you get a 1099, same concept. You're at somebody else's church. You're a contractor there bringing your expertise. You get a 1099. That's gross money for which you have your responsibility for your own taxes. Exactly. So let's say that you are the pastor of a church and you do 10 revivals and you get 10. How do you handle those 1099s? Are you paying for that when you do your taxes? Or are you saying pay quarterly on those revivals? I'm saying pay quarterly on those revivals. So if you have 10 revivals and you do, let's say, five of them for October through December and you mm -hmm. get, you know, let's say for those five, you get $5,000, then you should be paying quarterly taxes in January on that amount for that quarter. Now, couple of things here. When I say 1099s, that is an IRS issued form by the organization who um, contracted you. So by law, they have to submit any payments over $600 needs to be reported on a 1099. So that means that is in your record. Your social security number is going to be sent to the IRS because it's on that 1099 and how much you were paid. So it's going to get reported to the IRS and the IRS is going to reconcile that to your tax returns. Now, if a church has paid you more than $600 and has not issued you a 1099, technically you still are supposed to report that income. Exactly, because they may decide to report it later. Yes. That, so that can happen. That right. can happen. So, so if you, if you make the income... Right. If you make the income, whether they report it or not, you report it. Yes. Okay. Talk yeah. to me a bit about uh, housing allowances for clergy who are pastors, as well as those who filled out that form that says, I am a clergy. They sent in that IRS form. How do they handle their housing allowances? Say a bit about that. Okay, so with housing allowance, when you said submit in the form, actually, there is no technical form that has to be submitted to the IRS. What has to happen is that okay. the church needs to have ratified the housing allowance that is a part of the church's official record. Right. And so with it should be done a year in it before the year calendar year starts. So this is the planning season now to figure out what the housing allowance will be as a part of compensation, which will be deemed as housing allowance for the next calendar year. With the housing allowance, we know it's not subject to income taxes. It is subject what I'm calling social security or SACA taxes. So SACA is the language when you're paying for the all 15.2%. So in the case with pastors, they are responsible for the SACA taxes on the housing allowance, but not income taxes for that. Now, with okay. the housing allowance, 
Typically that amount, if a reporter correctly, will show up on the W-2 form for the pastor in a box. So it's accounted for, for tax purposes. If not, totally fine that it's not reported on the W-2, but it should be in the records and reconciled for the pastor because the pastor's on the hook for their taxes, not the church <laughs> at all. Right. This comes back to right. pastor, back to good record keeping. And then with housing allowance, all your receipts for the things that fall on the housing allowance. So whether it's your, your rent that you pay from your checking account or your mortgage, um, your uh, mortgage insurance, uh, anything that takes your furnishings that support your housing um, should have very precise record keeping associated with it. So if you have $24,000 or $2,000 a month as a housing allowance, then you could have $24,000 worth of receipts. Now, I'm using $24,000 as an example. If you are over, if you spend over $24,000 in housing allowance, let's say you spend $30,000 in housing allowance, that means you missed out on $6,000 you could have had in housing allowance. So you should use that That's number. Right. For now, if you have $20,000 instead of $24,000, that means you got to report $4,000 as income. That's not a bad thing. It's better to overestimate than underestimate your housing allowance. Okay. okay. Now, when it comes to housing allowance, things like that, I simply want to say to all ministers uh, out there, whether you are working for a church, a religious organization, or other nonprofits, make sure that you have a tax accountant working with you. Don't try to do this on your own. You will miss things that you can deduct and you will miss things that you owe. Get a housing professional to help you. Get someone to help you and they'll tell you where everything goes on the appropriate forms, okay? Um, another question that was asked, someone said that, um, let me see. How do I, what should I be paying a financial planner? If I wanted to call someone today, like Financial Founders, say, I need to get my financial house in order, what to pay a financial planner? We see all the commercials on television and et cetera. Give me some sense of that. What's reason to, pay to okay. get your financial? So I have to start first by saying all financial advisors are not structured the same. So you got to know who you're working with. Exactly. So financial advisors right. can charge one of three ways. They can charge commission. They can charge assets under management saying this is how much you have in assets and they charge your percentage of that. And or they can charge you like uh, a lawyer fee for service. And that fee for service can be an hourly fee for service, a project fee for service or a retainer fee for service. Now, I just said about how advisors charge. Then the next question is what services they provide, because not all financial advisors provide financial planning. Some may just provide investments, mm -hmm. which historically has been the case, and or sell insurance under the financial advisor kind of label. With financial planners, they are trained to provide advice on various aspects of financial planning to include goal setting, uh, budgeting, um, investments included, as well as insurance, tax planning, um, it's, you know, estate planning, very important as well too. Now we may not deliver all of those services. Think of us like a general practitioner for your doctor who knows about the whole body. And if there are certain specialties you need, like regarding your heart for a cardiologist, urologist, right? That's the kind of same concept with a financial planner. We know about all aspects of the financial body. We bring that together and then help you with the specialties. Okay. So let's now with that framework with a financial planner, let me go with what an hourly rate could be. It could range from like 150 per hour to 300 if you're just doing hourly. Then you can have your packages as well, too, that factors in kind of the time and the expertise we're putting into an engagement. Now, I will say on the spectrum, 
I love the wealth spectrum. There are people a part of the spectrum. So some people, if they're looking at just budgeting and savings, then I'm going to partner them with a financial coach because that's going to be more efficient for them to get the baseline. Do I do that work? Absolutely. Okay. And for all my clients, I do. So for how I see in terms of the spectrum, um, you can just for like baseline, quick conversations, you can expect to pay about 600 and it can be all the way up to three or 4,000 for a full plan. And that's going to be easily at least 10 to 15 hours of work because we're getting in all your data, figuring out where your statements are, your employee benefits, making analyzations, having questions to answer and walking along with you with the journey by giving you a plan, a roadmap to do that. So you've done a great deal of work with clergy. And so you're saying if someone is just wanting to learn to budget and save, you might recommend a financial coach. Yes, because with a financial if, if, Go ahead. So no, keep because you're very good at kind of getting to what people are looking for in terms of the response and understanding. OK, OK. So if so, you've given us some parameters in terms of prices for a financial planner and people need to be clear. There's a difference between an accountant, a financial planner uh, and you, there were some other terms that you used. advisor. And what I also say for people with baseline, just in full disclosure, this is on my website as an example, too. So I have three tiers. I have a wealth check that starts at twelve seventy five for three months. I have the income to wealth at thirty seven fifty. That's six months, and that's a comprehensive plan. And then I have my wealth management clients. And you know, before people had a hard time writing checks, but when I would go into their finances and work with them, people easily spend twenty five hundred on a vacation. So what I tell people exactly. in terms of your investment, if you and I, I can help you get more of a and pay me <laughs> too. But you yeah. because even if I help you figure out where the money is, for which I want to do, where is it going and how you're spending it does align with your values and goals. You also have to be able to be willing to commit the time um, as well too. Right. So I want to get rid of the notion that it's not accessible. It is. And I've seen people because of their mistakes spend Thirty, forty thousand dollars, and I'll start with what they have given to the IRS because stuff they have done over the years. So I am a lot cheaper as an insurance for the mistakes that people have made without having a financial advisor and the mistakes they could make if they didn't have somebody partnering with them. So for my business, I have different tiers for which people can start and build and move up the wealth spectrum. Okay. Do you provide? Uh, workshops, for instance, for ministers associations. So if someone wanted to bring together 20 clergy or 30 clergy for an association and uh, for you to talk to them for an hour or two hours, how do you deal with that kind of thing? Uh, I, I love the concept of what you call crowdsourcing or crowdfunding. Crowdsourcing. <laughs> For a couple of reasons, right? It is, it is the economic way of pooling resources together for the benefit of the greater good. So, yes, I have done and will continue to do uh, workshops in that in that manner. And then sometimes I even can structure based on the conversation. Um, it's depending on the size of the group, some small 15 minute one on ones. It's amazing that what you can accomplish in a short period of time just because I've been doing this so much and so long. So I, I do encourage because I know resources. You know, being a clergy spouse myself and for churches and budgets and that type of thing that and the salaries for which, you know, clergy uh, range can get that it can be costly. And this is a very good way of pooling resources um, in a way that, you know, help a larger body and can be just as effective to get the conversation going and continue it as well. I just wanted to put that out there to those clergy who might say three, four or five thousand dollars. But I have so much that needs to be done. Get together with a group of other clergy, 10, 20 other clergy, and you can bring in someone like Mrs. Braxton 
or other financial planners and everyone can get help at a reasonable price. Another thing I wanted to ask you about, because I found this has helped people. I mean, I've had you on talking to uh, our women of color uh, for those broadcasts. Let's say that you have a child that's four or five or six years old. We know how often we give children toys. How can you start saving for your children early or teaching your children how to be early investors? So what would you give a child or tell the grandparent or uncle or aunt to do instead of that toy? Yes. Yeah, so a couple of um, easy things to do. One is, and this is a name of an investment option called a 529 plan, 529 plan. All states in the U.S. offer a 529 plan. The easiest way to think about okay. a 529 plan is, is it is the college savings plan that's structured very like a retirement plan. So instead of the dollar being for retirement, they're specifically for college savings. So with the 529 plan, each one will have an opportunity to have the account number that you can share with family. So anytime family gets that urge to spoil the child, the grandchild, the niece, nephew, tell them transfer money, easy, write a check into this 529 to build that plan. Another thing that I love personally, and I encourage others to do as well too, is to keep in mind, any account for a child is going to be considered a custodial account that has part ownership for a child. So a custodial account based on the state law says that when that child becomes of age, whether it's 18 or 21, that account belongs to them. Now, even if you fund it, it belongs to them. You still can have control of it. So don't worry. They can't take off and run with it without your permission. Um, so with that in mind, I like to expose children to stocks. And there are a couple of platforms, but the one I like the most because it understands custodial plans and understand children who have access, safe access to apps, if you will, is Stockpile. Stockpile. So I actually use that with our own daughter in our house. Stockpile. Stockpile. S-T-O-P-K-P-I-L-E. And so our daughter, she mm -hmm. loves Netflix. I mean, loves it. And so she is the owner of Netflix. And she's done pretty well <laughs> since we've started this account. Uh, my nephew loves Nike. He bought Nike and guess what? And Colin Kaepernick and all that stuff, his Nike, Nike shares are doing quite well. Now, my niece, who I open an account for as well, so three, she likes Dave and Busters. Uh, that's not doing so well, but she likes Dave and Busters. We're going to add to her portfolio. So with, <laughs> so with the stockpile, they get to have their, because they're old enough, 13, to have their own phone apps. And then my seven-year-old has her little tablet so she can see how well it's performing. And they know these 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 um, stocks because they know the companies and they own them and they interact with them. So a way to get them exposed. And you can transfer $10, $15, $25. So I opened it and funded it with my husband we in last Christmas. And you know, when we come together, I'm like, okay, how's your stock doing? Or if I send a little text or something like that, that gets them engaged and it builds their portfolio. So you have an educational account just for education. You got a stock account, you know, that you're building and you can fund that or have somebody else to, to fund that to get them on their way for understanding wealth. Now, these insurance plans that I see out there for kids, I won't call any names, Gerber. I won't call any names. Let me call uh, it Gerber. Let me call Gerber. <laughs> Um, so let's talk about insurance briefly. So insurance is a way to kind of hedge and say those pieces have a savings component of it that may or may not give you value as they get older. Now, I'm not knocking insurance. I'm just saying read the fine print. If you're looking at the insurance as a saving mechanism, there are other ways to do that as well. So with those plans, particularly with girls that are not term for the life of the child, I mean, for just a term period, it has a savings component that may not give you the growth and all that you need. That if you kept it separate by looking at some of these other options, maybe a may be a better option for you. So I'm just saying, understand what you're getting into before you get into it. 
Exactly. So those are the kinds of things that you should ask a financial planner so that you don't just watch television and say, I want to buy Gerber to save for my child's college account. Question. Great, great. I really, really, that was really, really helpful. Um, another question that I think a lot of preachers are trying to, I mean, I'm not going to ask you to pick stock or anything like that, but are there some places, there's stockpile, are there some other places that you would recommend, if you can, uh, where preachers should consider uh, um, and looking for a steady return, not, I'm not saying become millionaires overnight, but what preachers who say, I just want to start to invest, where okay. should they begin? All right. So I got to give the spectrum so people understand investments you got to do. Very important. What I typically see people have this in terms of assets, right? Investments is an asset is have your emergency fund. That's three to six months worth of expenses, right? The other end of this barbell, if you will, is your retirement account. So for clergy, that's going to be your 403 B's. And if you have, you know, other, um, if you're a, kind of dual role, then it will maybe be a 401k in addition to 403b. So have those pillars in play, building up your emergency savings and having your retirement accounts. Now, going to your retirement accounts, if you take a peek at it, you'll see under the hood, there's a type of investments, two types of investments popular called mutual funds and, and ETFs. Now, with both of those types of investments, what you have is a whole bunch of stocks or a whole bunch of bonds or a combination of two underneath this. Let me give you an example. S&P 500 is a very popular index. 500 represents the top largest 500 companies in the U.S. So instead of you picking out 500 stocks, you can buy the S&P as an index and it's probably sitting in your company's or your 403B player. So you got to know what kind of investment vehicles out there as you transition to say, I want to invest. All right. So now I'm coming in the middle of the barbell where you're saying, I just want to invest. It's not my emergency savings. It's not my retirement account. It is just what's considered a brokerage account for which I can have access to it at any time. It's not earmarked for any of these two buckets. If this is your situation, a couple of things that you can think about. You can also have ETFs and mutual funds and hold it at a brokerage account like E-Trade or TD Ameritrade all the ones fidelity that have where you can pick your own investments. Most people start with something that is an index mutual fund that's already diversified. And the reason being, you don't have to worry about one stock going under because you got a whole bunch of them that if one goes under, the other ones can do pretty well. Now for those of us, and I think having a portfolio or some stocks exposure where you're picking yourself, like I'm doing with our daughter, where she's picking things she likes because she's watching it and seeing how strong it is for the company. Then there are some online other tools other than Stockpile. You can do Robinhood. You can do Acorns. You can do Stash. Now for these investments for individual stocks, I wouldn't have it as a huge part of your portfolio unless you know exactly what you're doing because you put all your eggs in a few baskets and you ain't studying these companies every day. You can lose a whole lot of your money. So what I'm saying, have some balance between things that are diversified, like an ETF, mutual funds. And then if you want to play around, which I like doing myself too, with some stocks, then set aside $25, $50 or whatever in these online apps where you can track and pick stocks low cost and have more risk, but you're not having so much money that could be risk for loss. That was a mouthful. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That made a lot, a, a lot of sense. And I'll go back to earlier what people really need to do, especially clergy, is to get the kind of financial planning advice that you need. If you say I'm too poor, I'm too broke, I did put a group together and financial planners will come. and. So you won't be, you won't have to pay 2000 for the advice. Your group can pay for it. So please, sir, please, ma'am, 
consider that it's quite important. I'm going to close with yeah, but, one yeah, last I just Go got ahead. two comments to make real quick. There are some financial advisors who certainly will, will come and, and give you a presentation and no cost to them. Totally fine for their model. What I want you to be clear on mm -hmm. is what they're offering when they're presenting to you, right? Um, and just, you know, keep that in mind because you may have people within your congregation who have that expertise and leverage them. So I'm completely saying leverage, leverage them and you know how people charge. So that way, you know, the education, you can separate that from the service that they are providing you. The other piece that I want to say now with technology, a lot of times, and even in my platform, I serve clients virtually. So I don't even have to be present. There's Zoom and ways that you can do group meetings as well, too. So those are my only two. Exactly. Comments. All right. That's wonderful. You can also serve people virtually, virtually. Uh, time has run out. Uh, Mrs. Braxton, this has been wonderful. It's been so helpful. And I appreciate uh, your being our financial guru guest for today. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, we've been with Mrs. Lizetta Braxton, uh, the head of Financial Fountains, a one uh, investment planning company for which she served as CEO since 2008. We appreciate everything that you're doing. We appreciate all of the work that you're doing to bring in more people up into financial planning, which is why she received the Excellence in Diversity Award. We thank you for all that you do. Uh, brothers and sisters, thank you for having joined me for this session of Preaching and Preachers. And as I always say, share the video. There are so many people out there who need financial help. Share the video. It won't cost you anything. Please, sir, please, ma'am, share this video with older preachers, younger preachers, ministers of music. Share the video. Thank you so much for joining me for this session of Preaching and Preachers. I'll see you next Monday at the same time, 12 noon Eastern Standard Time. God bless. Have a great week.